you to turn, in fact, to uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 1. We're going to pick up in our series, and uh, there's going to be a little slide showing up there in just a minute. There it is. This is our series, 2 Corinthians, Treasure in Earth and Vessels. And we're going to be in chapter 1, the latter part, and just to give you a heads up, uh, the chapter break there between chapter 1 and chapter 2, I don't think that's accurate. I think most scholars would back me on that. Uh, in the original Greek, there are no verse numbers. They're helpful. I'm not knocking them at all because those are an address so we can turn right away, right, and find out where we need to be. But we're going to bleed over into chapter 2 all the way to verse 4, okay? A rather short text, but not necessarily a short message. We'll see. I'll try my best. Uh, shall we speak to the Lord in prayer? Father, thank you for what we've just sung. Uh, and we want to say thanks, Jesus, for everything you've done, but more importantly, for who you are. You are an awesome Savior. And Lord, we pray if there be one or two here today who are just not sure of their standing with you, that today would be the day they cross the line and exercise faith and trust in you, Jesus, and receive you as their Savior also. I pray for all of us that you would give us a teachable spirit and eagerness to hear and to heed what you have deposited here in this portion of Scripture. We acknowledge that all of this is breathed out by you, and there are no errors here, and therefore it is authoritative for what we must believe and how we should live. And Lord, we want to eagerly obey because we love you, and we're grateful for your love for each of us. And so guide us now as we attempt to worship you with our minds and with our wills. We pray all of this in the mighty name of Jesus, and all my brothers and sisters said, Amen. Praise the Lord. Elizabeth Fry, you may not have heard of her. Her dates are 1780, 1845. She was a Christian philanthropist who lived in England. And uh, a lady named Joyce Brown writes about her in a book called Courageous Christians. And I'm going to quote, I've edited this for sake of time, but you'll be thankful. It's, it's a lengthy story. I'm giving you the Reader's Digest version, okay? You can thank me later. Here's how it goes. Elizabeth enjoyed a colorful, shallow life until she was 17. At that time, she heard a visiting preacher, and Elizabeth's life was never the same. That might be the same testimony that a lot of us would share, right? We've heard somebody preach the Word of God, and the Lord used that to bring us to faith. She began gathering poor children together every Sunday evening and teaching them Bible stories. When she saw where and how the children lived, she wanted to do more for them and for their families. She brought clothes and medicine for any who needed them, and she brought her Bible to teach everyone about the Lord. One day, Elizabeth heard about the terrible conditions women lived under at Newgate Prison. And so she went to the prison to pray with the women. No doubt she had second thoughts once inside, because as she was inside, she was soon surrounded by 300 screaming women who behaved like beasts, fighting, clawing, and swearing. Some had children. Many were nearly naked. All were dirty. If Elizabeth had shown any fear, she would have been in serious trouble. This was a tough prison. But she kept her gaze steady as she picked up a dirty child and told the women they must all do something for the children. She told them she would start a school if they would help. Elizabeth taught them about the Bible. She reached out to the women individually in friendship, telling of her faith, praying with them, and comforting those who were to be executed or sent overseas to convict colonies. Her trust and respect woke something in the prisoners. She gave them a sense of dignity. They were human beings created in God's image, and loved by him, regardless of what they had done. In time, officials were amazed at the change in them. It's been said that Elizabeth Fry loved the unlovable into loveliness. As a servant of God, Elizabeth Fry understood that God's servants must demonstrate love for others. It's a shame that it's a command, because I would hope we would want to do it, having been recipients of Christ's infinite love for us. But nevertheless, there's the command, and we're going to talk about this. But I want to ask the question of myself and of you, how are we doing in this area? I think we need to ask ourselves from time to time, just as a spiritual diagnostic, does my lifestyle 
demonstrate love for others. This is really the point of this passage, I believe. Here's the title, The Depth of My Love for You. Paul is going to express his love to the Corinthians, a very deep love, a love that is based upon Christ's love for him. And this is the main point right here. God's servants, that's you. You don't have to be in vocational ministry to be a servant. Hopefully we're all serving the Lord. God's servants, that's you and me. We must demonstrate love for others. Now, I have to tell you, this includes even those we would say are the unlovely. And it can be done. Every, every, every command that's in the Bible has the resources behind it. So we can never say, well, I can't do that one. We can. We can. Now, here's what I'd like to do. I want to ask this question. I want you to track with me. How specifically should God's servants demonstrate their love for others? There are a lot of ways. I can't give you all of them. There are plenty in the Bible, but there are two in particular in this text that we're going to focus on as we walk through this very brief text here. And here is the first way, and that is God's servants work for the spiritual joy of others. God's servants work for the spiritual joy of others. And by the way, this is one of those that if we're doing this well, the joy splashes right back on us, and we feel great about it, and they feel great about it, and then other people are blessed as well as they see the fruit of the Spirit, namely joy. And so, I invite you to look at the text with me. We are in chapter 1 of 2 Corinthians, picking up at verse 23, where Paul says very solemnly here, because this is a solemn occasion, but I call God as witness to my soul that to spare you, I did not come again to Corinth. Now let me share a little bit of background and we'll tear that verse apart, okay? So I think you'll remember some of the background here. Uh, Paul had planned to visit the Corinthians on his way to Macedonia. Paul is in Ephesus and Macedonia is just north of Achaia. Achaia is the region where Corinth is. So Paul's going to travel from Ephesus to Corinth on his way up to Macedonia. He's going to stop and spend some time, go back up, and then round trip, come back down and spend some more time. I get the impression Paul loves the Corinthians and actually wants to be with them. And they should have picked up on that, obviously. So that was the original plan. Uh, now, if you look at chapter 1, verse 15, you should be right there, verse 15. In this confidence, in the confidence that we have a relationship here, dear Corinthians, that you love me and I love you, you respect me and I respect you, in this confidence I intended at first to come to you so that you might twice receive a blessing, that is, to pass your way into Macedonia, that's the first blessing, he's going to stop there on his way up, and again from Macedonia, a round trip coming back down, to come to you and buy you to be helped on my journey to Judea. So that's the original plan. Now, those plans were made at a time when the Corinthians acknowledged Paul's apostolic authority. Things were pretty good between them. But as you know, these false apostles came in and they infiltrated the church and they took over many of the power positions and they found the little rabble-rousing group inside the church and did a little bit of a team effort with them to undermine Paul's ministry. As I think I mentioned last time, to attack Paul's character really is to attack Paul's message. And these men may have been motivated by pride and other things, but Satan is motivated by destroying the gospel. It's more than just Paul. It's his gospel that Satan wants to cancel, right? He's always up to that. He's always up to no good. And so Paul's in this awkward position here. He receives this news that the Corinthians had a change of heart toward him. They transferred their allegiance to the false apostles and kind of gave Paul the cold shoulders uh, and they were falling deeper and deeper into sin. So this is the problem and Paul's heart is broken over this and so as a result he modifies his plans and as I mentioned last time it's not a sin necessarily to modify our plans. All of us have done this for good reasons hopefully, right? But of course they're looking for any opportunity to give some bad PR against Paul and so he has this charge against him, uh, and sadly these false apostles point to Paul. They say his change in plans is a sign that he's fickle, that he's insincere, that he lacks character. They're really attacking Paul as a person. His integrity was called into question, and therefore, indirectly then, the gospel's integrity, his message is being called into question. So Paul then has to explain why he had 
his change in plans. And that's what he's doing here. And this is not so much to defend himself, ex except he realizes the gospel is at stake here. That's what it's all about. So back to verse 23 again. I'm going to read it. But I call God as witness to my soul or to my life that to spare you I did not come again to Corinth. This is a solemn oath. And since Paul's integrity was called into question, this occasion demanded an oath. And there are certain occasions when an oath is appropriate, such as, uh, if you can imagine, maybe you've been on a jury in a murder case in court. Somebody's life, or maybe a few people's lives, are at stake. And so the truth is paramount. We need to get to the bottom of what happened, who did what, etc. And therefore, many will take an oath. I'm afraid, though, this concept has eroded today because people take an oath for all sorts of flippant things. I swear to God, that's the best hot dog I ever had. I mean, you know, really? Really? Back in the first century, this was serious business. Paul is cognizant that he is in God's presence, and the mindset then was our thoughts, intentions, and motives are open before God. He sees everything. He can survey the inner person, and all of our thoughts are exposed to his scrutiny. And that's the case all the time anyway, right? Because he knows what you're going to be thinking three Sundays from now at 3 p.m., and you don't even know that yet. I don't know that yet either, right? He knows all things. Isn't it amazing that God knows us better than we know ourselves, and he still chooses to love us? Isn't he awesome? Things we wouldn't want to tell anybody, and he knows all about it. He even knows in advance things we're going to do, and he still chooses to love us. You're not going to find the other God like that. This is the one true God. He knows all things. His heart is big. And so here's Paul having to defend himself. So he does the oath and he says, here's the reason why that to spare you, I came no more to Corinth. That is to spare you of another sorrowful visit involving severe discipline. I came no more. Now keep your place and go with me to chapter 13. 2 Corinthians chapter 13. Keep your place in chapter 1. In chapter 13, I want to look at just one verse, and God willing, we'll get there at some point, unless the rapture occurs or something else happens, I don't know. But chapter 13, verse 2, he says, I have previously said, when present the second time, remember that painful visit? That's what he's referring to. And though now absent, I'm in Ephesus now, I say in advance to those who have sinned in the past and to all the rest as well, hear it, that if I come again, I will not spare anyone. Now you can go back to chapter 1. Based on that, they should be thankful that he changed his plans and didn't come with the rod of discipline. An apostle has a lot of power, right? And so out of love for the Corinthians, Paul compassionately delayed his coming. Instead of a trip, Paul then sends Titus to deliver what some call the severe or sorrowful letter. We talked about that before. We don't have it today. And as one scholar puts it, I think he's right on, he says, in the time between the painful visit and the news from Titus, that is the response to the sorrowful letter, Paul did not want to return to Corinth for fear that he would have to use his awesome apostolic authority. And so as a demonstration of love, Paul granted the Corinthians an opportunity to repent. Why? So that they might experience the joy of the Lord. If you have repented of sin, you know there's such a wonderful, exhilarating feeling that comes. Not that it's all about emotion. But knowing that you're right with God once again, and your heart is clean, and your conscience is clean, and you can lay your head on the pillow and sleep like a baby, there's a lot of joy there. When we're right with the Lord, that's where the joy comes from. And when we're not, that's what quenches the flame of joy. And so he's after their joy. You see, God's servants work for the spiritual joy of others. And there's something good about getting our mind off our problems and helping other people. There's a reciprocation that happens there. Look at verse 24, chapter 1, verse 24. Not that we lord it over your faith, but our workers with you, there it is, for your joy. For in your faith you are standing firm. He says, not that we lord it over your faith. Unfortunately, the false apostles accused Paul of being a domineering dictator, which was not true at all. It was a false accusation. 
The irony is it was the false apostles who really acted like dictators. Let me show you. Keep your place again. Go over to chapter 11. You may want to stretch your fingers like this because they're going to be doing a lot of walking here today. They're going to get a workout. Just wanted you to know that. Chapter 11, 2 Corinthians still, chapter 11. And look with me at verse 19. Chapter 11, verse 19. Paul is alluding here to their naivete, their foolishness, and allowing these false apostles to dupe them and actually move them away from the true gospel and basically take their allegiance away from Paul. Verse 19, chapter 11. For you, being so wise, tolerate the foolish gladly. For you tolerate it if anyone enslaves you, anyone devours you, anyone takes advantage of you, anyone exalts himself, anyone hits you in the face, and that's the false apostles really manipulating and abusing. Back to chapter 1. So if anybody was the dictator, domineering, it would be the false apostles. And it's interesting how often when people accuse others of things, they're really guilty of it themselves, and it's a deflection tactic. Isn't that amazing how that works? Unfortunately, the false apostles uh, were all about lies and deception. Now, as an apostle, Paul had the authority to discipline and to punish, if necessary, for the well-being of the church. And he would do it very soberly and prayerfully. But if needed, he's willing and empowered to do such. Yet, he didn't misuse his authority. He did not lord it over the Corinthians' faith. Now, notice he says faith there. And the reason he says that is only God has authority over a believer's faith. You know, we're answerable to God alone for the condition of our faith. At some point, every one of us at some point in the future, every one of us who are believers are going to have to lock eyes with Jesus. And we're going to have to look in his eyes and we have some splaining to do. You count on that. That's all of us. And so we're accountable to him for the quality of our faith, whether it's robust or anemic or whatever. Uh, there's no man over that. That's beyond the realm of anyone's authority, any human's authority. In Romans chapter 14, verse 10, Paul says, We all shall stand before the judgment seat of God. So we personally stand or fall based on the quality of our faith, right? There's no other religious figure who is the police over that. So Paul realized that his authority was not absolute. He had a healthy view of his authority. He knew it had certain realms and other realms were inappropriate for him. If you go back to 1 Corinthians, keep your place always, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, the previous letter, 1 Corinthians chapter 3. And if you look at verse 5, notice how Paul views himself here. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, picking up at verse 5. What's Paul's self-concept? Is he a proud man? Does he think he's bigger than life? Here it is, verse 5. What then is Apollos? And what is Paul? Servants through whom you believe just vessels, just tools, even as the Lord gave opportunity to each one. I planted, Apollos watered, but God was causing the growth. So then, neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but God who causes the growth. Now, you can go back to 2 Corinthians chapter 1. You see, Paul's authority was delegated by the Lord of Lords, who is the author and perfecter of faith. And Paul's saying, look, I'm just a tool being used by him. I, I am not the police over your faith. I'm not lording it over your faith. False apostles may have been doing that, but Paul was not guilty of such. He says, in fact, and the contrary, you see it? Chapter 1, verse 24. But are workers for your joy. What does that mean? What kind of joy are we talking about here? Well, Philippians 1.25, if you want it for your notes. Philippians 1.25. There Paul speaks of joy in faith. This is the spiritual joy of of faith. As our faith increases and becomes more robust and healthy, our joy should increase. That's the idea. There's a relationship there. Joy is essentially a spiritual experience. When our faith is strong, our joy runs deep. And indeed, when we yield intentionally to the control of the Holy Spirit, third person of the Trinity, we discover that the fruit of the Spirit is, among other things, begins with a J, joy, right? Joy of the Lord. It comes from Him. That's our strength. And that's how we want it. 
It's not from things and goodies and situations, but it's from the third person of the Trinity who dwells in us. And so, this is what Paul is after, and that's what we should be after. God's servants work for the spiritual joy of others. And as I say, there's a lot of joy in it for us as we do such. So as a demonstration of love, let's help others to grow in their faith and thus experience the joy of the Lord. Well, how do we do such a thing? I'm just going to give you a few suggestions. Uh, you may want to think about who you have in mind here and offer to pray regularly with somebody. It's only, not only good for them, it's good for us as well. Uh, years ago, I had what I would call a prayer warrior friend. Hopefully, we're all praying, but some people just know how to grab hold of God in prayer. And this fellow would show up at my door. We'd go upstairs to my study, put our faces in the carpet, and just pray seasons of prayer. And there was no time limit on it, sometimes shorter, sometimes longer, and crying out to God. And I can just remember having such a peace and such a joy being in the presence of God like I can't explain to you. Being in God's presence is a great place to be. Unless we have fear in our hearts of him. Perfect love casts out fear. And when our hearts are clean before the Lord, I can't think of anything better on this planet. I can't think of anything better. I can't think of anything better. And this is what Paul was after for these dear Corinthians. Even though they did him a bad turn here, he really loves them, and he wants them to experience the joy of the Lord. Now, you may want to cultivate a discipleship relationship with somebody. Now, that would include Bible study, prayer, and accountability, all for our good, but also to build them up. Maybe it's a younger believer, and you would like to kind of fire them up and get them at the next level. That's a great thing to do. As I say, your motive is to bless them, but it splashes right back on you when you do such a thing as you watch them grow. I have the privilege of seeing students every four years or so walk across the platform and pick up their diploma. And of course, we have uh, mentoring groups. I'm a part of a group where the students, we get to really know each other well. And I, as, they, as they walk down that stage, I just have a video in my head of all the challenges they've been through and the growth and seeing a lot more Christ-likeness three, four years later than when they first walked in the door. That's a beautiful thing. That's what we all should be doing. There's a stewardship involved with what God has deposited in our hearts. And so if we love others, we're going to try to build up their faith and help them to walk closely with the Lord. If we love others, we're going to be motivated and eager to promote harmonious fellowship, healthy relationships with Jesus and with others brings great joy. And I, I, look, I'm not naive. I realize it's tough sometimes. Sometimes there's some thorns. I get that. But even that can be a prompter to go to God in prayer. Even that can be used of God to make us more like Christ. And so sometimes we need that, by the way. And God loves us enough to let us get a couple stickers in our hands or wherever so that we grow and we're not so dependent on the world or on ourselves. The bottom line is God's servants, you and I, work for the spiritual joy of others. And so what are we learning in this particular text? We're learning that God's servants, you and me, all of us, if we know Christ, must demonstrate love for others. And we're asking, well, how specifically do we demonstrate love? Well, in this text, we have two ways. The first way is that God's servants work for the spiritual joy of others. And there's a second way, and here it is, God's servants work for the ultimate good of others. God's servants work for the ultimate good of others. Now, this one has a broader range to it. I'm going to spell that out as we go through. Now we're in chapter 2, verse 1. I believe, again, the, the argument just continues here. There really shouldn't be a break. 2-1. But I determined this for my own sake, that I would not come to you in sorrow Again, don't miss the words there. You see it? But I determine this. That verb indicates a careful and deliberate evaluation of Paul's circumstances. Now, does that sound like Paul is fickle? That's what he was accused of. This was very thoughtful. Paul was being very decisive in his plans, not fickle as he was being accused. He says, here's why, that I would not come to you in sorrow again. I made... Uh, a prayerful, sober decision 
not to come to you in sorrow again. The painful visit, by the way, was so unpleasant that Paul was obliged to leave in haste. He didn't want that to happen again. That would have robbed them of their joy. Verse 2, we're in uh, chapter 2 and verse 2. For if I cause you sorrow, which he really doesn't want to do, who then makes me glad but the one whom I made sorrowful? In effect, Paul was saying, look, we're closely bound together, O Corinthians. Your sorrow is my sorrow. Your joy is my joy. We have a bond here. And uh, if you're not happy, I'm not happy. And those whom we love, by the way, can be a source of great sorrow or a source of great joy, depending what's going on in that relationship. And I realize some of that's beyond our control. But from our end, we want to make sure we're doing all we can to promote a healthy, loving relationship. And that's why we need God's help. And so uh, what Paul is saying here is, look, I was with you a year and a half. You know my heart. Now, you've been duped and carried away by the false apostles. I'm just reminding you of what you already know. There's no new information here. Just remember how it went. So if you look at verse 3, he says, chapter 2, verse 3, this is the very thing I wrote, so that when I came, I would not have sorrow from those who ought to make me rejoice, having confidence in you all that my joy would be the joy of you all. Now, he's talking here about that letter he wrote after the painful visit. He returned to Ephesus, and he wrote, as I said, the the severe or sorrowful, depending who you talk to, letter. It was a tough letter, but I picture Paul weeping as he wrote this letter because he did love these people. It was a heavy, a weighty letter. Let me show you what I mean. Again, keep your place. Go to chapter 10 and look at just one verse there. 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Oh, I love the sound of those angel wings fluttering there. Can't do that with your uh, computer, right? I've got a Bible app as well, but it doesn't make that kind of a noise. They need to add that, a little audio there, so you can hear the pages flutter. It's a beautiful sound. Chapter 10, verse 10. For they say, now this is Paul's critics, but even they see how heavy this letter was. His letters are weighty and strong, but his personal presence is unimpressive and his speech is contemptible. We'll talk about that later. There again, they're slamming Paul again, but even they confess that this sorrowful letter or severe letter had a lot of heavy-duty stuff to it. Paul's trying to get their attention. And so you can go back to chapter 1. So the letter's contents must have been sharp. It must have been filled with rebuke. But motivated by love, Paul's prayer was that that sorrowful letter would move the Corinthians to repentance. That's what he's after. Now, this is the tough part of promoting somebody's ultimate good. Sometimes they're engaged in things that are not good for them, and somebody needs to care enough to tell them, to wake them up, to shake them, if you know what I mean, in love, to put them back in their right mind. Here's a verse, if you want it, for your notes. It's Proverbs 27, verse 6. Think about this one. 27, 6. Faithful are the wounds... Of a friend. What? Why would a friend wound a friend? I don't get it. Because they love their friend, and their friend's going off the deep end, and they're trying to rescue them. And they care enough to do something instead of smiling and walking away and let the person hit the self-destruct button. They care too much. Parents, you know what I'm talking about. Yeah, we want to be our kids' friends, if you know what I mean, but really, we're their parents, and sometimes we need to tell them the tough stuff they really don't want to hear. But they'll come back later and thank us. At least that's happened in my case. They'll come back, and you know what? You were right, and I thank you for putting a, a, a wall there and saying this far and no more. And so, here's the other half of it. But the kisses of an enemy are deceitful, and I suspect that would describe these false apostles. You see, repentance would be the best thing the Corinthians could do. In fact, Paul's severe letter had a good effect on the Corinthians. He made it tough for a reason to help them. Now again, keep your place. Chapter 7 this time. 2 Corinthians 7. Told you you're going to get a workout today. 7, 8. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 8. For though I caused you sorrow by my letter, I do not regret it, though I did regret it. For I see that the letter caused you sorrow, though only for a while. I now rejoice 
not that you were made sorrowful, but that you were made sorrowful, watch it, here it is, to the point of repentance. For you were made sorrowful according to the will of God, so that you might not suffer loss in anything through us. Now you can go back to chapter 1. Paul is in tandem with God's will when he writes this very, very tough letter. They did repent. And you see, God's servants work for the ultimate good of others, and the Corinthians' ultimate good was repentance, to put them back in their right mind. Verse 4, chapter 2, verse 4. For out of much affliction and anguish of heart, I wrote to you with many tears, not so that you would be made sorrowful, but that you might know, here it is, the love which I have especially for you. He says, I wrote to you with many tears. You see, the sorrowful letter was strong medicine, but the letter was really a heartfelt demonstration from Paul's heart of tough love. Paul was working for the ultimate good of the Corinthians. Here's a man who was selfless, right? For their own good, the Corinthians needed godly sorrow, which produces repentance. We're turning again. Boy, this guy's really working me out today. What's with this preacher? Chapter 7, keep your place, though. We're getting to, to the finish line. Hang in there with me. Fruit of the Spirit is, among other things, what else? Patience. Hang in there. All right, chapter 7, verse 10. We're almost done. For the sorrow that is according to the will of God, it's a good definition here, produces a repentance without regret, leading to what? Salvation. By contrast, but the sorrow of the world produces death. For behold, what earnestness this very thing, this godly sorrow, has produced in you. Now you can go back to chapter 1. So repentance would restore their relationship with God and with Paul. Can you see that God's servants work for the ultimate good of others? And he's really being used of God to put these people back in their right mind and to bring them back where they need to be with the Lord. So back to 2.4 that you might know the love, that word in the Greek is emphatic, he's emphasizing it, that you might know the love which I have especially for you. You see, many of the Corinthians had abandoned Paul for the false apostles, and despite the personal hurt, because they did turn their back on Paul after he's their spiritual father, he led them to Christ. Thanks, thanks very much, Paul. We're going with the false apostles. It must have hurt Paul. He is human, right? But despite that hurt, Paul still had an exceedingly deep and intense love for the Corinthians. Wow. You see, God's servants work for the ultimate good of others. It takes great love, great courage, great wisdom, and a lot of God's grace to rebuke somebody. And of course, we need to analyze our hearts and make sure our motives are pure and we're doing it for the right reasons, which would be love and the best interests of the other person. But God's servants are called to do so for the person's ultimate good. Now, maybe you know a believer who's beginning to drift or, in fact, has kind of gone astray. And for their ultimate good, somebody needs to approach them and somebody needs to speak the truth in love. Could that someone be you? Maybe you're the one because you're the closest to them, perhaps, or you have a little in in their lives, perhaps. What about the unbeliever? Let me ask you, what would serve the ultimate good of the unbeliever? Pretty obvious. Salvation in Christ, right? That's the urgent crying need of the unbeliever. Before anything else, they need Christ as Savior. Jesus said it's the one thing they must do, be born again, right? And so is there someone you know who needs to hear you speak the gospel truth in love? For your notes, 2 Corinthians 5, same letter, 2 Corinthians 5, 21. Paul says, God made Christ, who knew no sin, to be sin on our behalf, that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ. You see, receiving Christ as Savior is for the ultimate good of the unbeliever. And we, as God's servants, are working for their ultimate good. All right, here's the wrap-up. What have we learned? God's servants must demonstrate love for others. How do we demonstrate that love? Well, there are two ways. We've seen them in the text here. God's servants work for the spiritual joy of others, and God's servants work for the ultimate good of others. I'm going to take it to the Old Testament real quick. You don't have to turn. Leviticus 19, verse 18. 
The command is, you shall love your neighbor, how? As yourself. Then he says, I am the Lord. Now, even if my love for my neighbor is, let's say, 100 miles deep, which would be pretty good, my love for myself, dear friends, is a billion miles deep. There's a, there's a chasm there. So if the Old Testament standard is loving my neighbor at the same level as my self-love, then it will likely never happen. Now we move to the New Testament. Jesus comes along, and, and he, he raises the standard, actually. He says, if you want it, John 13, 34. He says, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. How? As I love myself? No, higher yet, as I have loved you, that you also love one another. So even if my love for my neighbor is a billion miles deep, equal to the love I have for myself, Jesus' love for my neighbor is infinitely deeper because his love has no limits, right? It's infinite. So if the New Testament standard is loving my neighbor at the same level as Jesus' infinite love, then it will certainly not happen. So I'm off the hook, right? No, 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 wait, 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 hang in there. So what is Jesus really saying? He's saying, look, love others selflessly and sacrificially even as I have modeled it for you while I was with you. And we can study Jesus' life and see what that looks like. All right, so then how do we love in this particular way? I'm just about done. I've got some R's for you here, and I'm going to move quick. Here we go. First of all, reflect upon the certainty of God's love for you. Reflect upon the certainty of God's love for you. This is where it all begins. So for your notes, Romans 5.5. 5. The love of God, that is God's love for us, has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. This certainty of God's love for us will stir us to love God even more, right? And when we love God even more, which is a great thing, we love ourselves less, and selflessness, like Jesus, stirs our love for others. Selfishness douses the flame of love, right? Beyond that now, another R for you, rely on the Holy Spirit's enablement to love others. Rely on the Holy Spirit's enablement to love others. 1 John 4, 12 and 13. 1 John 4, 12 and 13. No one has beheld God at any time. If we love one another, God abides, notice, in us, and his love is perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in him, and he is in us because he has given us of his spirit. What is that all about? Well, one scholar puts it this way. It is by the spirit that we are enabled to love. In our fallen and unredeemed state, we are both blind, unable to believe, and selfish, unable to love. It is only by the grace of the Holy Spirit, who is the spirit of truth and whose first fruit is love, that we ever come to believe in Christ and to love others. The Holy Spirit, don't leave home without him. In fact, you can't. If you do, you got a problem. All right, remember. Third R, remember. Remember to pray for the needs of others. Remember, if you need a prompter of some kind, develop that. Remember to pray for the needs of others. Philippians 1, 9 and 10. Just one example here. And this I pray, that your love may abound still more and more in real knowledge and all discernment, so that you may approve the things that are excellent in order to be sincere and blameless until the day of Christ. You see, intercession helps us to empathize with the person for whom we're praying. You know, they say, walk in somebody's shoes for a mile. I would say, just pray for them for a while, for their needs, and all of a sudden you'll see it from their perspective, and your compassion for them will grow, and your love for them will grow as well. Here's one more, Romans 10.1. This is Paul referring to his fellow Jews. He says, brethren, Romans 10.1, my heart's desire and my prayer to God for Israel is for their salvation. Did Paul empathize with Jewish people? Sure he did. His heart broke for them. Last R, reach out to actively love others in a tangible way. Reach out to actively love others in a tangible way. It has to come to action at some point. Here's a quote from C.S. Lewis, very helpful observation on Christian love. He says, it would be quite wrong to think that the way to become loving is to sit, trying to manufacture 
affectionate feelings. Some people are cold by temperament, and that may be a misfortune for them, but it is no more a sin than having a bad indigestion is a sin. And it does not cut them off from the chance or excuse them from the duty of learning love. The rule for us all is perfectly simple. Here it is. Do not waste time bothering whether you love your neighbor. Act, there it is, A-C-T, act as if you did. As soon as we do this, we learn one of the great secrets. When you are behaving as if you love someone, you will presently come to love them. If you injure someone you dislike, you will find yourself disliking him more. If you do him a good turn, you will find yourself disliking him less. What's he saying? The short version of that is love is active. If it's not active at some point, it may just be emotion or something other. And so God's servants, you and me, we must demonstrate love for others as Jesus did for us. Amen?